Good evening, everybody. Uh, Chef Crystal and I welcome you to our finishing week in CE 187. So uh, congratulations, everybody. You've made it to the end of the course. Uh, I think Chef Crystal and I are really, really impressed with uh, the results that we've seen with everybody. I think there's been a lot of learning that's been going on uh, so far. Uh, week four in this course, I think was fantastic. Saw a lot of people get their work in early, uh, which we have been talking about quite a bit lately. Because uh, as you go into industry, you're going to need to develop a sense of urgency. It is critical that you work ahead of the game, uh, stay organized, and become very, very efficient. Uh, that, was, that is one of the signs of a very prolific chef. Uh, and uh, so we highly recommend that you begin developing those skills now. Chef Crystal, do you have any comments about week four? Um, I do not have any comments about week four. We focused mainly last week on suppliers and costs and like how to buy stuff. If that's terrible to say, like how to buy stuff, who to buy it from. So, yeah. you know, just remember, ask for the order guides. That's ask. right. So last week, we covered a lot of that information. We talked a lot about uh, contractual obligations with purchasing things from purveyors. Uh, we talked about how to develop and uh, institute some basic costs. So create some guidelines for your menu establishment. So uh, make sure you guys keep that in mind. Those are tools that are going to set you apart from the remainder of the competition once you are in industry. Let's move on to our finishing week, ladies and gentlemen, here in CE 187. Please remember that the last day of this class is Tuesday, November the 5th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. What that means is all assignments are due. So please uh, don't come knocking on the door Wednesday, November the 6th or Thursday, November the 7th saying that, hey, I forgot this or I forgot that. Uh, there's not much we can do for you at that point because we have a quick turnaround time until the next course starts. So we need to make sure that we get everything in and done uh, right away. If anybody in this course feels as though they're struggling or have any concerns about their grades, now is a great time to reach out so we can help you out and uh, help you get through the remainder of the course. Chef Crystal and I's number one intention is to see everyone succeed and leave this course with a 100, which looks fantastic. Hey, this week, ladies and gents, you have a uh, discussion uh, forum, right? That is about a particular product, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Uh, but make sure that your uh, discussion and with two peer responses is due no later than Tuesday, November the 5th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then by the way, ladies and gents, coming up this Sunday, November the 3rd, is uh, the time change. How's it go, Chef Crystal? We don't change time in Arizona, so... Uh, that's good. We, we're just like the same time all year round. Casual. I know it's spring forward and then fall back. So I think we lose an hour. You lose an hour. Okay. Anne is shaking her head. That's correct. So we, and Marshall's up there. He's doing it. And we got a few other people doing the same thing. So I'm, on, wow. I'm not going to lie to you. I just learned last year that Arizona and like I think another place doesn't do daylight savings time. Yeah. So. That's way too complicated for us to handle. It's so strange to me. I've never lived that life. Yeah, it's nice. But it, the biggest problem is, is that everybody else around you changed the style. So that's, yeah. that's what messes you up. Veronica, what's going on? Veronica, did you have a question? No? Okay. No, Maybe. I was just saying that we actually gain an hour in the fall because you fall back and you lose an hour in the spring when you spring ahead. Is that the way it works? Yeah. I know, that, I know that our old clock is set to um, 7 o'clock, so I just felt like it was going to go back to 7 o'clock. No, it goes back to 6. At like, so like on Sunday, at usually at 2 a.m., you set the clocks back an hour to 1 a.m. Okay. So it gives yeah. you an extra hour. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I liked it because at the club, we had another hour to party. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I love V. She's always seen the bright side of things. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Uh, no, just Arizona just doesn't have that mentality. We're, we're way too close to Mexico to make any changes like that. So uh, we, we keep strumming along. Ladies and gents, make sure that you remember to take the end of course survey for extra credit. It is a big bump to your grade, everybody. Uh, just go on. It's at the very top of the class page, uh, which I will show you here uh, momentarily. Uh, I'll show you right now, so we'll get that out of the way. But um, it, it's at the very top of the class page. It only takes just a moment to uh, fill it out. Escoffier takes your opinions very seriously uh, because that's what we utilize to grow the program. So if you see something that you felt as though you should have learned that you didn't learn, uh, or th there were some gaps somewhere, um, you know, let us know so we can improve the program. Uh, so it really helps us out quite a bit. Week five, ladies and gents, we're going to kind of uh, tie up some loose ends, the, a couple of things that we didn't cover in the first couple of weeks as we go out. Appreciate all the questions uh, tonight, so please feel free to ask. Now is the time for those of you uh, that are on your way into industry. We didn't talk much about the classic kitchen brigade uh, as developed by Auguste Escoffier. And by the way, it was his birthday, October the 28th. Uh, so uh, he would have been quite old. Uh, I don't know exactly how old, but it would have been in the hundreds. Quite old. <laughs> yes, very old. But he is the one that is noted as developing the kitchen brigade. The modern kitchen layout that we have today is because of his efforts. Here's a look at some of the positions. The chef de cuisine uh, is a fairly common kitchen today, especially in higher end facilities and in a lot of resorts. Basically what the chef de cuisine does is he is the one that runs the actual restaurant. The food in the restaurant coming in, the executive chef, the guy that's at the top, will oftentimes uh, in a larger facility uh, manage multiple outlets and manage multiple chef de cuisines. Uh, primary focus is a lot to do with finances these days in the restaurant industry, uh, especially in larger facilities. Directly below the chef de cuisine, we have the sous chef. Uh, the sous chef is in charge of the kitchen when the chef de cuisine or the executive chef is not present. And they are also the one that helps enforce policies. Larger hotels, uh, the, my background that I come from, we have an executive sous chef or multiple executive sous chefs who work directly below the executive chef who will oversee the chef de cuisine. The uh, sous chef or the executive sous chef position in kitchens I like to refer to as the gunnery sergeant, uh, the guy that is leading the charge down the hill and makes sure that things operate according to the way that we plan. Uh, and then we have various other positions within the uh, kitchen. Saucier, Saucier you'll find in larger hotels and resorts. Uh, those are the ones that are uh, responsible for producing all the different sauces, stocks, and soups that are served. And then the poisonier, which is in charge of seafood. Then we have the grill guy, the fry guy, uh, the vegetable guy, Garmage and then the patisserie, which is the pastry chef. Uh, one, some of the other positions that aren't listed in the kitchen that are very common now are um, chef de partie, which is a banquet chef. Uh, chef Crystal likes the chef de partie, I can tell. And then we have various other line positions that we refer to them as uh, prep cooks, line cooks, grill cooks. Uh, seafood cooks. Does anybody have any questions about positions within the kitchen? Something that I just wanted to note is that um, those positions in the kitchen, I know they get really fancy, but if you look at them, you can relate them back to something to remember them. Like, um, I never remember all of the, the, the positions, but I can look at it and see what it does. So like, sa saucier, correct you? Saucier. It's like sauces. So I'm like, oh, okay, stock soups and sauces. Perfect. Um, there's another one that does fish. I can't say it. How do you say it, Chad? Uh, the fish is a poison air. Yes. And it looks like Poseidon and he lives in the sea. Those are the ways that I kind of like remember what it is instead of asking because sometimes you don't want to ask those questions. 
you can, of course, but I always want to remember, have like a, a tool to remember stuff. So if you look at the, the words and the actual meaning of what the position is, you can kind of, you know, get like a little trick to remember what the positions are. Absolutely. Good suggestion. Ladies and gents, I wanted to share with you some career advice as far as advancement is concerned in the kitchen. Um, a lot of us, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you, once you get into the kitchen, you'll kind of be entry level, uh, starting out. And how do you climb the ladder in the world of culinary arts? Well, there's a couple of different methods that we do. Number one that thing that we look for is professionalism, right? Can they show up on time? Do they have proper uniform? And then we also take a look at, are they willing to assume additional tasks? Uh, if you can start undertaking small tasks in the kitchen and completing those tasks successfully that aren't in your job description, that really stands out. And that is something that the chef will take a look at because they know, hey, he's got the drive to resolve additional issues in the kitchen. Another big thing, is we don't like people that are uh, constantly bringing up problems within the kitchen. That is a big issue. We like people that communicate problems and share solutions, right? Hey, by the way, chef, I noticed that my reach and cooler is running at 55 degrees. I went ahead and I notified maintenance for you to get that resolved. Just wanna let you know. Excellent. And then we like people that are there a few minutes early and leave a few minutes late. Very, very important to show that uh, dedication. Uh, when it comes to calling in sick to work, uh, ooh, that's a tough one. There are times when you cannot work or should not go to work uh, because you are sick. However, remember, uh, when you do call in sick to work, you have to put that work into somebody else's lap and it creates a big backflow in the kitchen. Uh, that is looked down upon with grave eyes. So uh, make sure that you adhere to your responsibilities. Make your work your priority, right? So dedicate yourself to your position and growing. Make positive suggestions. People that walk around in the kitchen, right? I think we've all worked with people like this before where they walk around and they say, this isn't good. I don't like that. I don't get paid enough. We refer to those people as cancers, right? And cancer spreads. And we don't want cancer in our business, right? And we've all been associated with a friend like that. Always remember when you get into the kitchen, positive attitude, right? Positive life. It's very, very simple. So the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, hard work, professionalism, sense of urgency, and learn to follow instructions. Right? That's the hard part, I think, for a lot of folks. That's the hardest part right there, following this instruction. Yes. If you are scheduled at Tuesday, better be there Tuesday. Very simple. Ladies and gents, let's take a look at a couple of positions in the front of the house. Right? Some typical positions that we work with, and I think Chef Crystal might be able to help out with this as well. We have a sommelier. A sommelier is the person that goes from table to table selling wines. They're also responsible for maintaining the wine inventory and purchasing wines. Uh, in larger or nicer upscale facilities, that is a big job. Uh, wine sales can be quite a significant number. You can talk at the current facility that I'm associated with, we'll sell anywhere between 150 or two to $200,000 a month in wine. So uh, it's a big responsibility for the sommelier. And then we have the dining room manager. The dining room manager is often referred to as the maitre d' de hotel or just the maitre d'. Uh, he is the guy that is orchestrating the flow of everything that is in the dining room. So uh, he's the one that is in charge. And then depending on the style of service that your facility has, um, a lot of places will just have waiters, right, that, that take the orders and run the food. Other places will have uh, head waiters, and then we have what is called food runners, right? So the head waiter goes table to table, manages the table, takes the orders, makes suggestions, makes sure that the guest is well taken care of, and then when the food comes up in the kitchen, we have a back waiter that takes the food out to the guest. 
that's a pretty common uh, style of service today and it happens to be extremely effective. However, once you get into other styles of service such as French service, <clears throat> you will have wait staff teams, uh, which is captains, waiters, and back waiters, and then essays, right? An essay would be referred to as a service assistant. And they are teams that take care of the section of dining room. <clears throat> so those are some of the basic positions. Chef Crystal, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, so like, of course, I, I feel like you have your maitre d', but then you also have hostesses, but usually the hostesses work underneath the maitre d'. Or you either have one or the other, correct, Chef? That is absolutely correct. One of the most important positions in a dining room, believe it or not, is the hostess, right? Because the hostess controls the flow of traffic in and out of the restaurant. For example, when you work in a busy place, uh, you might have a little wait time. And a lot of times you'll look around the dining room and you'll notice that there's not a lot of people in the dining room, but there's a five minute wait. You don't understand why. That's because the hostess is controlling the flow. If Chef Crystal was my server and she had 10 tables, if I let 10 people sit at those 10 tables all at the same time, guess what? Chef Crystal is not gonna be able to get to 10 different places at exactly the same time. Then you have very upset guests. Have you run into that situation, Chef Crystal? I have run into that situation before where I have um, employees going on lunch and so, I have to step in and they sat everybody before they went on lunch, which is great, but they all sat at the same time. And so everybody's order is going in on the same time. And that backs up the kitchen and that holds up the front of the house. People are bringing out food late or I came the same time they came. How come their food coming out faster than mine? Ah, it becomes hectic. You just have to find that flow to, I used to sit people and I might sit two tables at a time every 10 minutes. And there was tables open, but it's okay. You can wait. A 10 minute wait is nothing compared to an hour wait. So people are fine with waiting 10 minutes. They're not fine with waiting three hours or waiting for 10 minutes to sit down and then having to sit and wait for their food for seven years. So. Yeah. It's all about you know controlling the flow and the maitre d and or the hostess they start with the people coming in you know wait time is a big thing in the restaurant industry if you have a ridiculous wait time regardless of how good your food is you're going to still lose business because people don't want to wait and then you know how long is it going to take for your food to come out are you overloading servers by sitting too many people in their section are you rotating are you giving the kitchen enough time to um, bring, cook the food and bring it, and people bring it out still hot. Those are all things that you have to think about as a maitre d' or a hostess. And it's a, it's a game. I love it. It's one of my yeah. favorite things. That's, that's great advice. And you also have to remember everybody that a restaurant is like a funnel, right? Regardless of how much you put into that funnel, all, all, <laughs> only so much is going to come out the bottom of that funnel. And a, a lot of people are under the assumption that we can put a lot of people into our dining rooms and everything is going to come out simultaneously. It doesn't work that way. Just picture a funnel, right? If you put a lot of liquid into it, only so much is going to come out the bottom of it. So it's a general rule of thumb that we want to uh, really work towards. Chef uh, Crystal brought up some points about waiting for food right? We have very specific measurements that we utilize for industry standards. You need to be approached by a server at your table within three to five minutes of being sat. It's very, very important. That's an industry standard. Your order needs to be back to the kitchen within 15 minutes of being sat. So for example, you sit down within three to five minutes, you need to have a server at your table taking your drink order and making menu suggestions. Immediately following that, within the 15 minute mark, you need to have a server at your table taking your order. <clears throat> After the order is received in the kitchen, it should take no more than 10 to 15 minutes for the kitchen to produce your food. Okay, so now we're at 30 minutes that you've been in the restaurant. You finally receive your food. 
it should take the average guest anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to eat their food, right? So now we're at one hour. Immediately following that, you should have your guest check within 10 minutes of the end of your meal. And then within five minutes of that, you should have your guest check concluded. So we would like to say that the average turn in a restaurant is right anywhere between an hour and 15 minutes and an hour and 30 minutes. Does that make sense for everybody? Those are general rule of thumb. So if you are planning on creating a restaurant, like we talked about earlier in the course with 100 seats, right? So if you have a table of four people, four people sit down, you know you have to block that table out for at least an hour and 30 minutes. Very, very important uh, in order to give your dining room plenty of space because we don't want too much going into the funnel because only so much is gonna come out the bottom. Very, very important. Something that also helps with, with like watching how fast your tables are gonna turn over is walking your floor, meeting your guests, having those general conversations with them, making them feel like warm and fuzzy, but at the same time, seeing how long they are gonna be. <laughs> well, what is I mean, they don't know that I'm waiting for them to leave, but if I'm walking past, hey, how you doing today? Nice to see you. Is everything okay? And I see that they're on their last bite of their burger. Okay, I know that they're about to get their check. I probably have another 15 minutes before they're going to be gone. So I can tell somebody the wait time is 15 minutes for the next table. Yep. So it kind of like helps you guide rather than just doing math in your head. Walking around, seeing your floor, knowing how fast or how long it actually takes people to finish the food in your restaurant really matters. So as I, great, great, uh, great information, and that's very true. A visual inspection of what's going on is required to run a dining room. Now, as I look out upon the screen, I see a sea of chefs, and I know that we're all, uh, all of you are headed to the kitchen uh, uh, to start your successful careers. We are probably thinking, what does the front of the house have to do with me, right? I'll be in the kitchen. Remember, at the beginning of this course, we talked about the three elements to a uh, very important or a very good dining experience. One, we have ambiance. Two, we have service. And three, we have food. Regardless of how good your food is, if the service isn't there, it doesn't matter. The guest won't come back, right? If the ambiance isn't there, it won't come back. Everything has to be in conjunction. When you get into industry, you're going to notice hopefully not, but you probably will notice that oftentimes there will be friction between the front of the house, which is the dining room, and the back of the house, house, which is the kitchen. We run into situations where the servers will go out and they'll go from table to table to table, and they'll take order to order to order. Then they'll go to the POS system and they ring in all the orders all at the same time, and then you as the chef are back there in the kitchen just watching your ticket machine go crazy, printing out tickets, which we call this experience roundhousing. And then you have the server back in your kitchen five minutes later wanting to know why all their food isn't coming up. So the communication between the front of the house and the back of the house is critical to make your organization work. Visual inspection, if it's kind of quiet in the kitchen, stick your head out in the dining room, see what's going on right? Keep an eye on the flow. It's also your responsibility when you get into your shift each day, find out how many estimated covers are coming on board that night. It's very, very important to plan your, your night out. You have to communicate with everybody that's in the facility. Don't assume that the kitchen is the, front, the long and the short of it because it's not. It's one part of a three-part experience, ambiance, service, and food. A lot of times when you go into a restaurant, if the food is not good, service can save the situation. If the food, if the service is not good, food can help to save the situation, right? So you have to be on the top of your game for each entity. Ladies and gents, we're gonna dive into uh, place settings here for just the next few minutes. I'm not gonna get too much into detail, this slide presentation is on your class page, uh, so it's there. We're gonna talk real quick about a casual uh, place setting. And it's very, very simple. 
you'd always need to remember, and I don't know how many of you have gone into a restaurant and looked at all the silverware on the table and said, which one do I use first, right? Ca yeah. Casual place setting, right? Is always going to be two forks on the left side and then a knife and a spoon on the right side, okay? You always start to eat with the silverware from the outside to the inside. You start with your glassware from the outside to the inside. The outside of your glassware is the left-hand side, okay? Where I work and where the place I'm associated with, when we set a table setting, it has eight pieces of glassware, right? So the guests always start with the left. We have four forks, two knives, three spoons, and then um, a butter knife on each setting, right? So that is a very formal setting. You're going to run into the term a lot with casual settings with a, a term called B&B, &B, right? Chef Crystal knows what a B&B &B plate is. Absolutely. It's a bread and butter plate. It's a small round plate that will be set up above the left-hand side of the plate. So casual place setting, ladies and gentlemen, remember, two forks on the left, fork or I'm sorry, knife and spoon on the right, and then water glass up above the fork, and you're set. It's that simple. Any questions about a casual setting? Take a look. Oh, I got the water glass on the wrong side. It goes up above the knife. This is a, a casual place setting right here. Uh, you would find this in a bistro or a cafe type setting. Napkins are commonly served over the top of the plate. There are a thousand different napkin folds out there. For I've only got three, Chef. I've only got three. Know. I've only got three napkin folds. You can't do the swan running through the lake? No, not, no, not at all. <laughs> or the, the elephant <laughs> jumping the bridge. And all it. Oh my goodness, they're so intense. <laughs> Ladies and gents, this is a formal place setting. Right, and we're not going to go through each and every one of these items. Uh, in a formal place setting, uh, you do expect linen on the table. You do expect an uh, upscale form of plateware, uh, dinnerware. Dinnerware, uh, when I'm referring to knives and forks and spoons, those are traditionally sold by weight or by gauge of stainless steel. So when you go into a formal restaurant and you pick up the knife, it should be heavy. The fork and the spoon should be heavy as well. The glassware should be heavy and large. It's something to be expected. The linen should be crisp as well. Uh, and this, once again, is on your class page. I don't want to dive into every single item because people might fall asleep. Take it gets really intense, Chef. Huh? It gets really intense. Setting all this stuff. And yeah. you know, ladies and gentlemen, we, we did uh, touch on this subject briefly, briefly, and in this previous slide, you did see where it says three star or three diamond. Um, there are two primary rating systems utilized in the United States. One is the AAA system. They are the ones that are responsible for handing out diamonds, right? Five diamonds is the most that you can have. Five diamond facilities are extremely expensive to operate and very, very labor intensive. Whereas one diamond facilities would be a, a Denny's, an IHOP, very casual, uh, very easy to get in and out of, um, very, very simplistic. It is not referred to the quality. It doesn't refer to, the, uh, to the, how good the food is. It primarily refers to the facility and the style of service, that rating system. The other rating system that we utilize in the United States quite a bit is called the Michelin Guide. Is everybody familiar with the Michelin Guide? If you're not, I would highly recommend that you get involved with it. Michelin Guide was started by the Michelin Tire Company back many years ago, back in the early 1900s when automobiles were first coming out and about. They created this guide as a way to uh, guide travelers to gas stations uh, so they could get service for their tires and their vehicles. And as the guide grew, they started pointing out good places to eat, good service stations with good food. And as the guide grew, 
people started turning to it as recommendations for places to eat. In today's world, the Michelin Guide represents the best of the best. They do the star system. There are three stars, right? One being a very excellent, high quality service, innovative food, all the way up to three stars. And I believe in the United States right now, there's only about four three-star restaurants. City of Chicago has 22 Michelin rated restaurants. New York City has 25 rated Michelin star rated restaurants. So if you ever get the opportunity to eat there, I would highly recommend it. But those are the two primary systems, Michelin and AAA. Ladies and gents, formal place setting, very, very nice, very elaborate, lots of stuff going on on that table. It is labor intensive to set. So uh, remember that when you go to do a restaurant, you have to remember each piece that goes down has to be washed, has to be polished, and has to be reset. Also no remember- No fingerprints, yeah. <clears throat> no fingerprints, bad. We don't like that. And also remember as well, the more elaborate, right, the busier your uh, dish area is going to be. For example, if you do a banquet for a five course meal, right? That's five different plates. And if that's for 300 people, five times three, that's a lot, man. So you're up in the 1500 range right there. So, uh, you know, that's a lot of plates going through your machine. So the more formal, the more cost that is uh, incurred. This is a four to five star uh, diamond rating for very formal dining. Uh, we kind of call it ultra formal dining. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of silverware and plateware that goes on to the table. It's, uh, it's a lot of work, and uh, you pay your servers a lot of money for setup and breakdown. Did you see how fancy the soup spoon and the cocktail fork were on that right there, guys? Look at that. Look, at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's how we huh? Yes. And make sure, as a chef, that your dining room is serving the appropriate utensil for the appropriate dish. I can't tell you how many times I caught a busboy taking a teaspoon or a tablespoon to a guest that needed a spoon for their soup, right? There are soup spoons for soup. There are steak knives for steak. There are entree forks for entrees. So these are little touches that make your place or break your place. So make sure that you follow that. Chef, I know this is off topic, but another thing to remember, and it's often forgot, is have enough forks, knives, and spoons for your restaurant. Ooh. Not just one or two for each person that comes in. You need to have enough for the busboy to throw away in the trash because it's going to happen. <laughs> you need to have that kind of stuff on backup because nobody wants plastic silverware at your fine dining restaurant because you ran out of forks or glasses. So just a thing. That's a great point because uh, trash cans are one of the most expensive things that you have in a restaurant. The busier it gets, the more silverware that ends up inside your garbage can. Because uh, sometimes it's a lot easier and people get really funny. Sometimes the busboys get really stressed out. They're like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. So they just put it into the garbage can uh, and they go fast. I had a dishwasher uh, years ago. Uh, he was, we were doing a large banquet. He was just tired. He couldn't do anything. Couldn't do it anymore. So he just decided to take all the stacks of clean plates or dirty plates rather in the kitchen and just stack them with the clean plates. Uh, it was a lot, lot easier. And uh, so uh, the next day we were doing a banquet and every other plate was dirty. So uh, he wasn't with our operation much longer after that. Uh, taking a look at a formal place setting. Wow. Look at all that. That's lots of money on that table, isn't it? So, Chef, what are those um, glass things that the butter knife is on? It's just a knife rest. So what that does is that prevents uh, your knife from touching the table. Fancy. Right? So, yeah. So if you were to spread your um, spread your butter, then you'll set it on top of this. This right here is a butter dish. This is a dish for um, uh, crustaceans. Uh, right. If you're serving oysters or whatever the case is. However, in this environment, we would serve the oysters uh, in a separate plate, plate on a bed of crushed ice, right? Then you have your uh, white wine, red wine, champagne flute, sherry glass, water glass, 
your B and B, which is your bread and butter, dessert, uh, dessert, and then your um, that might be an oyster fork. I'm not sure what that one is there at the top. So that's a lot, isn't it? A lot of stuff. The fact that everybody has their own individual salt and pepper shaker and butter is just. Yes. It's not appropriate to reach across the table for your condiments. It's, it's not. It's not. Yes. At that price level, when you're charging that kind of money, everybody should have their own stuff, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we also get into the world of a lot of cultural dining, right? Uh, which we see quite a bit. Uh, so you need to be very respectful and very understanding of that. If you ever do an event at your hotel resort or your restaurant that is featuring uh, Asian cuisine, it's kind of interesting to see the way they set up their tables, which I've always looked or liked. This is what we call a lazy Susan in the center of the table. It spins around. So each guest has easy access to any of the buffet items. This is a major Asian banquet going on right here. Uh, they'll put the entrees into these dishes and then they spin that uh, so everybody can easily have access to whatever they want to eat. If you've never had the opportunity to eat at one of those places, go for it. It's worth it. It's kind of cool. And then, of course, the Japanese have their own style of setting the tables as well. And you're welcome to take a look at this uh, whenever you like. So just a, a look at a couple of different styles of service real quick before we move on to another subject. Uh, we have American style service, uh, which is generally full service uh, plated uh, in the kitchen. Uh, the formality can go anywhere from medium to very formal. And then we have the buffet style service. I'm not a big buffet guy, uh, except when it comes to larger groups to facilitate feeding them quickly. Um, but it does provide a lot of variety. I used to do uh, a lot of buffets for football teams. I used to take care of professional football teams. Uh, those gentlemen would eat five to six times per day, and they would have approximately 15 to 20 different items on each buffet. So to plate that was impossible. So we would set up double-sided buffets, which allowed them to eat very quickly in between practices. So that made it and then we also have what we call butler style service, which is the gentleman or the gentle lady walking around uh, with the towel over the arm uh, doing the hors d'oeuvres. We can't forget about counter service or cafeteria style service where our guests approach the counter and uh, that's a Subway or a, um, a Subway or Chipotle type service. Here's a couple of different uh, styles that kind of fall underneath the, um, uh, uh, I guess, American style service, uh, so to speak. The Russian service uh, is something that's uh, very, very formal, right? Extremely formal. It's the food is served on platters and set into the center of the table and the decorations are elaborate. And then we have French service. French service a lot of times is done table side. Uh, such as salad preparations, go bone out fish, uh, Dover sole, that type of thing, or flambés uh, also go with French service. And then family or English service. English service is very similar to Russian service where it's done family style. Uh, the food is set at the center of the table and then passed down. Chef, when I... Um... This is how I learned about French service, guys. Um, when I was in culinary school, we had to go to a fancy restaurant for a class. It was just like a research paper we had to go. Um, and so I was like, oh, I'll get the Caesar salad. And then they came out and they made the dressing in front of us. And I'm a freshman, so I didn't know what Caesar's dressing was made out of. And they started like mashing up sardines. And I was anchovies. like, oh, anchovies, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting when you get to see all that stuff. And I love, I, I, I've worked in a, a lot of the, the French and Russian style restaurants over my career and, and seeing some of these captains that go out there and do the work table side, very talented how they can bone an entire Dover sole by just grabbing the spinal cord, then lifting it out. And it's a, it's a dramatic presentation and you actually pay for a lot of that as well. So 
<laughs> it's neat if you ever get to experience chopstick etiquette. It's big. If you ever uh, get a chance to travel to Asia or you do something in your restaurant of that nature, they're, um, they're very big on that. It sends a lot of signals. You know, if you rest your chopsticks on top of your bowl, that means you're done. The server will come by and clean your bowl, right? Chopsticks should not be used to dig round, or uh, you shouldn't be digging around on your plate looking for a particular morsel. That's not etiquette. They consider that digging your grave, right? You should never ever cross your chopsticks at the table. That's bad, because that means it's a sign of death. Right? So be very careful when you go to a Chinese restaurant. Etiquette is a big deal. Ladies and gents, let's move on to the next thing uh, real quick. We've covered this uh, slightly a uh, couple of weeks ago, and I just wanted to review with everybody about how to wow people with your menu. Very, very important. Make sure you choose the right menu layout. Down here at the bottom of the uh, page is a menu that is horribly done. Right? We talked about menus should be at least 40% white space. This is an example of a menu that is not 40% white space. I look at it, I get stressed. I, I did like too, it. Chef. I wanted to look away. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, ow, that hurts. Whereas if you go with a menu that is 40% white space like we have here on the right-hand side of the class page, easy to read, nice, clean, organized, set into sections, very easy to figure out. If I want meat, if I want fish, Right, it's all very, very simple. Make sure you pay close attention to those fonts. We talked about that. A lot of different fonts on a menu confuse people and it is not good. So make sure that you put a lot of thought into your menus. I always recommend uh, <clears throat> people print out the menus at your restaurant. Do not pay to have them printed out. It becomes very, very costly because then you have to have somebody redesign it. You have to send somebody to the printers and printers aren't cheap. And it also prevents you from making easy changes on your menu. So be careful. Ladies and gents, these are some cool numbers that we need to take a look at here real quick. Overall, food sales in most restaurants account for about 66% of revenues, okay? So that's big business. Beverage department will contribute the other 34%. So a restaurant, a typical restaurant, about 66 or two thirds of the uh, revenues generated come from food and the other third comes from beverages. Over here on the left-hand side, we see a breakdown of how that works. Entrees are gonna be your biggest sellers. Desserts and appetizers are going to be your second and third seller. Remember that when you go to do your menus, it's always a good idea to run a little bit of a higher food cost on your appetizers and your desserts, which entice customers to purchase them. So we don't always do a 30% food cost on our appetizers. A lot of times we'll run a 50% food cost, which lowers the price to the consumer, which entices them to purchase, right? And as far, as far as a breakdown of revenues of uh, beverages, uh, non-alcoholic drinks will generally make up in a lot of facilities the majority of beverage revenues, right? Wine, eh, it's not so much. Beer and mixed drinks come in next. So that slide is in your class page for your uh, review. This is really interesting. We talked about this extensively. I think it was in week two where we talked about the plow horses and the stars and all that other kind of stuff. The different menu items that make up the composition of your sales. It's really important to note that only about 16% of your menu items will generate 80% of your revenue. That's a pretty staggering number, right? 16% or 16% 16 of your menu items generate 80% of your revenue. So be very conscientious about that. This is a general rule of thumb. We like to have 777, right? Not too big, not too crazy. Keep it manageable. The ingredients used in your seven appetizers should be utilized in your seven entrees. It reduces the amount of inventory that you have. 
and it creates a better flow of food as well. So there's no ideal number, there's no perfect number. Uh, you might find that three appetizers, 10 entrees is right up your alley. And you might find three desserts works perfect. So you gotta keep working those numbers. Don't just start and assume that you've done it. Always remember this, 16% generates 80% of your revenue. It's really interesting. In the restaurant industry, we use a lot of different tools to measure our sales. A proficient chef prints out his Z report or his X report from the register each night. And what that report tells you is how many of each menu item you sold and what percent of the sales they are generating. What that chef, tells is that also referred to as a P-mix? Uh, I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. What's that mean? I don't know specifically. But yeah. X, X and Y are the, are the two big reports. Uh, the, the X report actually zeroes the machine out, whereas the Y keeps a running total uh, on the machine. And you always want to take a look at those numbers, especially when it comes to doing prep, because you're going to understand how much you should buy, how much you need, and how much you're probably going to sell based on historical information. Very, very important. It says it means product mix, and it is a list of the products that you sold in. I like it. I'm going to remember that term. Okay. Yeah, cool term. We're always learning new terms here, man. I love acronyms, right? All right, ladies and gents, we talked about this too, and I just want to review this real quick as we are at the, uh, the finishing part of our class here. Choosing the right menu layout. We talked about the golden triangle, right? You know, how your eye starts on the right, goes to the left, and then goes to the center. Remember that. The type of menu you, uh, you create should reflect your theme and concept. Word of advice from somebody who's done it. Just because you think your menu looks good doesn't mean your customers do. Always get multiple opinions before you go to print on your menu, right? How many panels are you gonna have on your menu? The more panels you have, meaning the more rows, the more sections or the more, more folds, the more difficult it is for customers to find what they are looking for. So always remember that. People do not read menus, they scan menus, right? They make up their minds very, very quickly. So please, please remember that always. We also talk people about- People have default um, menu items too. Like if I don't see what I want, I'm just gonna get chicken tenders. Yep, yep. I'll stick with the sous vide filet mignon with the black garlic demi and the butter squash ginger puree for the 10th night in a row. Um, ladies and gents, color on your menu too. Color confuses people, right? I don't recommend doing it, but a lot of people do like color. Uh, number one, color is expensive to print. And if you are tracking your sales and understanding your product mix, like Chef Crystal just mentioned, you're going to understand that you will need to re print menus on a fairly frequent basis to get it as efficient as possible. So you might want to stick with black and white. However, yellow or certain colors can help your menu pop. There are certain colors on a menu that you want to avoid. Red. Red creates a sense of urgency. Yellow. Yellow means caution. McDonald's, the interior of most McDonald's, was yellow and the reason they made it yellow on the interior is they did not want people lingering in the seats right because you do not feel comfortable in a yellow seat it is a psychological fact because the color yellow to most of us means caution so you don't want to sit there and think like that blue blue is considered to be the most unappetizing color there is there's fairly few blue foods uh, we have purple potatoes that come in kind of bluish when you cook them. We have blueberries, but beyond that, there's not much. Uh, so blue also has a tendency to make people kind of down a little bit, right? So be very, very careful uh, of the items. There's also a suggestion, you hear this quite a bit, it's also on this page, about using pictures. I don't like pictures on menus, right? 
because not the food, the food should, but it always doesn't come out exactly the same. And uh, it's a nightmare when you have a customer that holds up the picture next to the plate and says, it doesn't look like this. So um, I don't know if you've ever had that happen, Chef Crystal. Um, no, no. <laughs> we cut back on the pictures. And the pictures that we use were just like generic pictures, like this is what a crab leg looks like. So now you know what a crab leg is. Instead of, a, instead of a steak, we put a picture of a cow. Yeah, this right? is a cow. You're going to get a piece of it. Would you like it? Nate makes it easy. <laughs> All right, ladies and gents. Uh, I, I'm sure, and I know this is a fact, but a lot of you uh, uh, kind of struggle with uh, narratives or got frustrated with narratives or didn't care to do the narratives. Uh, menus is where that really comes into play. Menus and communicating with staff and guest members or guests period. Uh, it's very, very important that you learn how to communicate your food and your objectives in a clear and concise manner. And that's what those narratives are used for, right? A good description can increase your sales dramatically. Be brief with your descriptions, right? People will not read them, right? They go by very, very quickly. Remember, they scan menu items. They don't read menu items. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a restaurant before where they have very lengthy verbiage. Our tomato sauce was created by my grandmother in 1930 and has tomatoes, bell peppers, and basil, and uh, people don't read it. It's too much. They will skip it over. Choose your words very, very carefully, right? Uh, these words are constantly changing uh, over time. Uh, words like uh, crisp versus fried really have a totally different target market, right? If somebody is theoretically watching their cholesterol, which they're probably not eating out in the first place to save calories, but the term crisp sounds much healthier versus fried. Uh, today's big term is farm to table, which is not a good term in the United States because it truly isn't farm to table, but uh, locally produced uh, can be a real uh, term to help you charge more money for your product because people are willing to pay more for locally produced and fresh product. Be careful about geographic uh, distinctions on your menu. Okay? For example, if you are serving halibut, do not put on there specifically where it comes from because the halibut come from different waters during different times of the year and it can get you in trouble uh, in the long run. For example, as well, if you're going to be serving prosciutto, do not put on your menu prosciutto de Parma unless you are buying your prosciutto from Parma, right? Because it does catch up with you in the long run. Menu honesty is very, very important, right? I'm not gonna get into this too much in detail, but we did talk about this last uh, couple of weeks ago about the stars, the workhorses, the puzzles, uh, and the dogs. Very, very important to learn this information by running your product mix. Things to avoid. That's my old saying. I've been in this business so long, I can tell you what not to do. I don't know always what to do, but I can certainly tell you what not to do, right? Don't make it too hard to read. Keep it simple, Sam. Kiss, keep it simple, Sam. We talked about layouts, very, very important. Spelling mistakes, always read your menu backwards. Please understand that. Read your descriptions backwards and read your entire menus backwards. It will help you catch spelling mistakes. <clears throat> Don't make that price pop out. We talked about that. If somebody's price conscientious, they're gonna look for it, right? Keep your menu conservative. We just talked about 777. Don't go crazy with a huge menu. Yeah, it doesn't work. People aren't gonna buy stuff. And then don't make everything look the same, right? You can use different sizes of fonts, right? Bold, italic, but don't go too crazy with your font, otherwise it's confusing. Ladies and gents, are there any questions so far? Anyone? Anyone? It's 8.30 at night, people are tired. Ladies and gents, a couple of things to remember. 
Last day of class, Tuesday, November the 5th, 11.59, everything turned in. Discussion forum this week, and I wanna show you that real quick before we wrap up. And then don't forget the time change this Sunday. Very, very important. On the class page this week, ladies and gentlemen, we have the discussion forum. And then we also have a knowledge check. Your, um, you will be automatically assigned to one of these items. You are going to discuss whether it's best to prepare it in-house or uh, purchase the item. You might have to do some research on the internet to get appropriate answers. You need to have your initial submission done by Saturday, please. Saturday, submit, initial discussion. By Tuesday, you need to respond to at least two other students. Your initial discussion post is worth 60%. Your other two posts or replies to students are worth 20% each. Please do not contact me next Wednesday and say, I forgot, I didn't get a chance, I was too busy. Uh, no, just sit down tonight and do it fast, fast, super fast, right? And then down here, you have a service and menu analysis knowledge check. You can post attendance at any time during the week by completing an activity with a check mark to the right hand side. Lots of opportunities to post attendance this week. Make sure you read these. You get points when you read these. So make sure you do that. Any questions, ladies and gents? We did have one question and it was, are we taking another core class right after this class? So. I'm not sure what the next class is. I don't know if they go to farm to table after this. Um, I can post it though. I'll send out a class announcement uh, as soon as I find out which way they are heading. And then V had asked when will we get the info on that on the items, but I think she, V, if you could um, explain that question, I'm sorry, I don't want to not answer it correctly. Yeah, like uh, he was talking about the, the, he posted like cheeseburger, fries, whatever. Oh, it's at the bottom. Of the one of those items, are we picking it or you're giving it to us to? You will be automatically assigned. Yes. This and it's going to be on the class page. On the class page. The system should assign you one of those. Okay, yeah. thank and you. And then you will decide whether it's best to make it in-house or purchase a product, and then you will explain why. Right? French fries, for example. If you are working in a place that has a $10 per person check average for burgers and a Coke, uh, you're probably not going to want to carry the labor to make French fries from scratch or the inventory. So it would be more cost effective for you to purchase the French fries and then cook them versus buying potatoes, cut them, blanch them, keep them in water, et cetera, et cetera. Are you the Greg? Hello? Okay. Hello? Hi. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> All right, ladies and gents, thank you very much for a great live session. Um, I hopefully we got everybody's questions answered. It has been a pleasure working with all of you for the past, uh, what, five weeks now, and the class went by extremely fast. We are proud of this class. Lots of 100s going on. I really like that. Chef Crystal, you want to say your goodbyes? Guys, this was one of my first classes on the culinary side, and I loved it. You guys rocked out. I'm so excited for you guys to continue in the program. And thank you guys for welcoming me with open arms. Yeah. Thank you, Chef Warren. I appreciate you as well. Appreciate, appreciate you as well. Ladies and gents, as well, Chef Crystal and I would like for you to share with us your future successes. Keep in contact. Don't be afraid to shoot us an email or shoot us a message. Uh, we really enjoy it. It's always a great idea to bounce ideas off of other chefs. So, Willie, what was your question? Um, a, a quick question. All right. What is, and maybe you can help me. I, I want to make some toast. And I want to transport it, but I want it to remain crispy. What, what would you guys recommend that the easiest way of, tra of transporting it so it remains? Are you saying toast? Toast? Huh? Just toast. T O A S T. Yeah. Uh, the the best the best way uh, to do that is to lay the bread out on a sheet pan, 
and let it sit out overnight. So it uh, reduces uh, the amount of moisture in the product and then make your toast and then transport it. Okay, because I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to um, audition for the, the chef thing Saturday. So it's oh, part cool. of my audition of making. Awesome. I, we keep us posted on how that goes, Willie. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Dry the, dry the bread out first, then make the toast, and then you'll be in good shape. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Best of luck. Yeah. Best thank, of luck. Thank, thank you. Uh, I'll keep you guys posted, too. Most definitely. Please do. Right. Ladies and gents, have a fantastic night. Look forward to talking to you soon. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone. Oh, the end of course survey. Yeah. Don't forget the surveys. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys.